Hey everyone, welcome to this new installment of Cortex Tutorials. Today we're going to learn about high-level movement. More specifically, we will learn about Cartesian actions, angular actions, sequences, twist commands, and joint speeds. As you can see, like in the previous video on how to get started with the Cortex API, I've already created a mashup of all the appropriate examples for today's tutorial based on the examples from our the Kinova GitHub repository. So this file here, movement high levels.cpp, is not available on GitHub, but don't worry. As usual, its entire content is already available inside the other files. So like last time, let's go through the entire code line by line and make sure we understand everything. This block of code here, we're already familiar with. This is to initialize the API, and this is what we've covered during the getting started video. Here, we are using a new client named basically client. This is the irate client that is able to prompt responses from the robot at one kilohertz. We're going to use this later on to be able to get the feedback from the robot to see where its tooltip point is located at. Now let's see an example on how to move to the home position. The home position is something that's already available inside the robot uh, as soon as you open it out of the box. So it's an existing action that's already stored in the robot's database. What we're going to try to do is to fetch it inside a database and then uh, run it. So first we have to make sure that the robot is in single servoing mode, single level servoing. So we can set the servoing mode here. To make sure that the message is sent properly, we wait for 500 milliseconds. And now we can start to fetch the information that's inside the robot. So first, what we're going to do is get an action type. Here, the own position that we're trying to look for is a reach joint angle type of action. So now we're going to use the base client to read all the actions of the action type we chose, which is reach joint angles, and uh, get the handles. Here, we're simply looping through all the actions that are inside the base that share this reach joint angle type. And as soon as we hit one that has the name home, then we set the handle for that action as our action handle. Here, we return if we cannot find the action we're looking for. Otherwise, we're going to run this block of code here. So what you can see here is the setup to use the notifications in a future promise structure. How to use future and promises as well as other asynchronous calls is going to be the subject of our next video. So for now, just assume that this is what's going to be called back when the robot starts and stops moving. Now, all we have to do here to run an existing action is to call the base client and use execution, execute action from reference using the action handle that we found by scanning the entire database. Here, the future is waiting for the promise response. So basically, we're waiting for the robot action to finish. Once we're done, we unsubscribe from the notifications and we return. That's it for playing an existing action. Before we try to make our own action, let's go and see what's actually inside one. So if you go into the Canova GitHub repository in Cortex, API, CPP, doc, markdown, messages, base, and action markdown, you can see that the contain of an action is actually an action handle, name, application data, as well as an action parameter defining the type of action. Inside the action handle, let's see what's there. So first we have an identifier. This is how you can fetch a desired action and reuse it. Then there's an action type that decides whether your function is actually going to call a reach pose or reach joint angle or something fancier. This value here is automatically changed whenever you change the action parameter of your main action. 
And finally, there are permissions in case you want to get your action to be only read-only, editable, or deletable. Now let's move back to our main script. Then into our Cartesian action movement example. So to start a Cartesian action movement, the first thing we need to do is to create an empty action by calling the constructor from the base namespace. Then we need to fill it in, which we will do in this create Cartesian action function. The first things we do is we set the name and application data for our action in case we want to reuse it later. Then, since we're going to make a reach pose action, the first thing we need to do is get the constraint pose by using action mutable reach pose. By doing this, it automatically sets the action type of our handle to a reach pose action. Then the constraint pose contains two parameters. The first one is the pose of the robot, which is the X, Y, and Z position of the end effector, as well as orientation following the Euler X, Y, and Z notation. We can also set constraints on the constraints pose if we want the action to follow a constraint. For example, if we want to use a target uh, Cartesian velocity during the action. In the case of this example, let's first assume that our default values are satisfying to us. Then, as you can see here, we're finally using this new basic client we've initialized earlier. We will go into further detail about the cyclic client in a future video, but for now, just know that the refresh feedback function give us uh, all the feedback data from the robot at the most recent uh, time step. In particular, we're interested in the tool pose, which is x, y, and z, theta x, theta y, theta z, the same way a pose is defined. Now what we need to do is to fill in the target pose we want to reach, in this case, by using set y, set, uh, set x, x, y, and z, set theta x, set theta y, and set theta z, we're setting the robot to go to its current position plus an offset on the y and z axis of respectively 10 and 20 centimeter. This way, whenever we launch this action, no matter what's the current pose of the robot, it will move by 10 centimeter along the y axis and 20 along the z axis. Now, how do we execute it? Let's move back to our example. So we've created an empty action, we filled it in. Here we created a callback that will tell us when the robot is done moving. As I said earlier, we will go into asynchronous function calls in a later video. And this is where the magic happens. The base simply calls execute action of our action, and then the robot will try and reach the pose that we put it at a target. If you're a long time user of Canova robots, you might have used play Cartesian trajectory of constrained pose. This function is still supported in order to be retrocompatible with older code. However, note that it, for the purpose of future development, you should consider this function as deprecated and always use execute action. Then we wait for the robot to be done moving in this while loop. This is done using the asynchronous function call as well. We unsubscribe from the notification and we're done. Now let's make an angular motion. We move back to our main script and then to our example about angular action movement. Like we did for the Cartesian action, the first thing we do is to create an empty action. Then we will fit it in. As usual, we can set a name and application data in case we want to re reuse them later. And then, in order to create angular action movement, what we have to call is mutable reach joint angles. This automatically sets our action type to a reach joint angle action. Because reach joint angle actions, uh, you actually want to set up different angles for all the actuators, you first have to call new joint angles. So inside your actions, you call the mutable joint angles. Then, for each of those joint angles, you will want to set a target actuator that you want to modify the target angle, as well as a value. So in this loop, we're setting the target position for all the actuators to zero. 
Now, if we move back to our example, we created our action, we filled it in, we've made an asynchronous function callback, and then we called execute action. As you can see, it's the exact same function call as if we were sending a Cartesian action. Again, for long-time users, you might have used play joint trajectory of constrained joint angles. But as was the case with play Cartesian trajectory, you should consider for future development this function to be deprecated and always use execute action. Then, for the rest of our example, we simply wait for the motion to be over, unsubscribe from the notifications, and then get ready for the next action. Now that we know how to make actions, we can queue them to make programs. In the Cortex API, those programs are called sequences, which we will examine inside the example create sequences. Sequences are created similarly to actions, meaning that first you need to create an empty sequence by calling the constructor, and you can set its name if you want to look for them. However, the main difference is instead of containing an action parameter, sequences contain tasks. So you can add tasks using sequence.addTask, and then each task contains a group identifier as well as a mutable action. You can fill in this mutable action using the exact same function that we created earlier, uh, create Cartesian action. In the second case here, we add a second task and set another group identifier, and we call create angular action, the other method that we've created earlier to fill in this mutable action. So now we have a sequence containing two tasks with the actions that we've defined in our example about Cartesian actions as well as angular actions. Here we create another callback to notifications to know where we are when the sequence is moving forward. And then to create our actual sequence to run, we need to get the handle that is created by calling the base create sequence of our sequence structure. Then we can send the sequence handle to the base by using play sequence and the robot will play the sequence as we built it. Now we wait for the robot motion to be over and the program is done. Now what if we want to move the robot, but we do not know a target pose either in Angular or Cartesian coordinate systems? Then, if we know the general direction where we want the robot to go, the strategy is to use velocity commands. In Cartesian, a velocity command is called a twist command. So let's see our example on twist command. First, as usual, the first thing we have to do is to create an empty twist command, and we can set its reference frame. By default, the reference frame of the uh, twist commands is the base of the robot, but you can change it to me in the reference frame of the tool. This way, if you move in the Z direction, instead of going up, it will go towards the finger of the robot. Then inside your twist command, you will need to access the mutable twist. And the twist definition is set by using set linear x, y, z, and set angular x, y, and z for all the components of the motion you want. Then simply send the command by using send twist command of your command. Send twist commands can be updated while they are running because these are not actions. However, if you send one and then st start ignoring the robot, it will move in the direction you sent forever. So what we do here for the purpose of this example is we let the robot move in the direction by three centimeters per second in the y direction and then five degrees per second in the z orientation. And then we stop the robot by calling base stop, which automatically actually sends a twist with all zeros everywhere. We can do the same with angular speeds. So let's see our example about joint speeds. First, let's say we want to send a speed of 20 degrees per second to a few actuators, namely the first, third, fifth, 
and sevens. All the other actuators we will need to send speeds of zeros and this is done by sending the values inside a joint speed structures. The joint speed structures is actually a list of speeds for all the actuators so we need to fill in all the elements one by one. So in this for loop we get the joint speed of each element of the list by adding joint speeds. We set the joint identifier that identifies which actuator this command corresponds to. Then the values that we want, in this case those are the values we set in speed here. And finally a duration. Then we can use the command send joint speeds command of joint speeds through the base and the robot will start moving for as long as the command is not overridden with something else. So here we can wait for 10 seconds and watch the robot move and then the robot is stopped. So now that we know how everything works, let's see how it behaves on the robot. I will now launch the program. So the arm is moving to its home position. Now we're sending our Cartesian action. Then we're sending our joint position action, sending the robot to zero. Starting our sequence. Sequence ends back to zero. Then we're sending a twist command for five seconds. And finally, we're sending a joint speeds command for 10 seconds. You may have noticed that at the beginning of our sequence, as well as when we started the twist command, the robot seemed to behave weirdly. The reason for this is because we are sending Cartesian commands, either positions or velocities, when, we're, when the robot is starting at a singularity. Indeed, uh, the robot placed with all its joints at zero is a singularity position. So to avoid this, we need to modify our sequence. And every time we end at the zero position, we need to move back to a safe position. So for this, we're going to reuse our move home uh, example and do it right after our angular action as well as after our sequence which finishes with an angular action as well sending the robot to zero. So let's try again. First we need to build All right, so the robot is moving to its own position. Now it's sending its Cartesian action, its angular action going to zero. So now we're moving back to our home position, which is safe out of singularities. Now, since we're using the exact same starting position, our sequence should have the exact same behavior as are both of our actions called one after the other. So our sequence finished by going to the zero. We're moving back home one last time. Now we're sending a twist command that sends a velocity to the robot as well as changing its orientation slightly. And finally, we're move sending the send joint speeds command for 10 seconds. And that's it. Now we know how to move the robot. That's it for today's video on high-level movement. The video will be shortly followed by a hands-on session to see if we can apply what we learned today. Also, stay tuned for our next tutorial video on how to use notifications and asynchronous function calls. Thank you for watching and goodbye.